Well, firstly, thank you to Stephen Hale and the Modern Monetary Lab for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, it's one I wish I didn't have to give because this is life-threatening. Uh, it isn't just that uh, mainstream economics leads us astray about the functioning of the monetary systems, as we all in this course know it does. It's also, I think, potentially jeopardising the capacity to have an advanced civilization on this planet. It's that bad. And um, what I'll start with is my own personal perspective on this, because I've been a critic of the, the mainstream and of neoclassical economics for pretty much 50 years. I started being a critic in 1971, halfway through my first year course at Sydney University. And I didn't actually look at their work on climate change in any great detail until after as an academic I'd made a, a positive contribution to the literature. And I did that with my good friends Bob Ayers and Russell Standish, uh, working on a, a way of bringing energy into production functions, both mainstream and post-Keynesian. And the little insight that enabled me to do that was the vision of uh, that labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. So rather than tacking energy on as the third factor of production, which is what neoclassicals do, you've got to include energy as an input to labor and to capital without which they can do no work. So having done that, I thought, okay, now I can actually engage in the literature. And I thought what I'd need to be doing is to explain why the, the growth model they use, the Ramsey growth model, is inappropriate and why the, the high discount is also the wrong thing to do. I haven't even got there because what I found instead was they made simply delusional assumptions about what climate change actually is. And it's easily the worst work I've read in over half a century of critiquing neoclassical economics. Uh, what they're doing is not denying that climate change is happening. They're not total denialists like that. But they effectively, effectively deny that it actually matters. And the only way I can interpret how their brains must be working to, to accept the sort of assumptions they make is that Neoclassical economics makes you into a zealot about a vision of capitalism as an ideal society. And you therefore spend your whole life trying to make the real world look more like your textbook. And part of that therefore says that capitalism can cope with anything and therefore nothing can be a serious threat to capitalism, including global warming. And then they go about assuming the numbers to reach that conclusion. Now, this is some of the actual literature that I've, that I've read to give you an idea of just how delusional this lot are. In his 1991 paper on whether you should or should not do anything about climate change, he says human societies thrive in a wide range of climatic zones and non-climatic variables like labor skills, access to markets, etc., etc., swamp climatic considerations. Well, yes, across the planet, yes, there are people living in, um, in Alaska and there are also people living in the Bahamas, but they can trade with each other. If the entire planet was the Bahamas or the entire planet was Alaska, things might be rather different. So but this is showing immediately he doesn't really understand what climate change is about. And then in doing his numerical estimates, he said that three degrees warming would cause about a one quarter of 1% fall in GDP. And he was willing to pump it up to one or 2%. But as he said there, uh, it's a hunch. Now again, he had a, in 1994, he did a, he, uh, Nordhaus did a survey of so-called experts. Ten of them were economists, nine were other disciplines, three were scientists, and one of the scientists refused to answer the questions. This is the sort of shit, and pardon me, that's the only way I can describe it, uh, the sort of shit that the economists were throwing out, saying that three degrees by 2090 would be small potatoes. Okay? Trivial impact upon the economy from a three degree increase in temperature. And I'm sure this is Larry Summers, by the way. It's got Summers uh, handprints all over it. It takes a very sharp pencil to see the difference between a world with and without climate change or with and without mitigation. In other words, even without trying to do any uh, mitigation of the impact of climate change, it has a trivial impact on his model, his head model, of what the economy is about. Now, at the same time, they had two uh, natural scientists in that survey of 18 people effectively, and their estimates were 20 to 30 times higher than mainstream economists. But rather than being shocked by that and actually exploring why, looking why scientists might be seeing far greater dangers from temperature rises than the economists were, he just simply brushed it off and never returned to the difference between what scientists were saying and what economists were saying. And the IPCC, which we tend to trust to give us the news about the, the likely impact of climate change, they hire the so-called experts in each field. The experts in climate are experts. The experts in economics are neoclassical economists. And you get the same nonsense coming out of it. For most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to everything else. 
Now, the numbers they provide are, are, are absurdly small impact from climate change. So in a 2018 paper after he was given the Nobel so-called prize, um, or so-called Nobel Prize, Nordhaus said that a seven, six degree increase in temperature would cause global GDP to fall by 7.9%, which is trivial. Uh, and he's not alone. I, I, we actually had a, a paper rejected by some neoclassical referees saying nothing like Nord, what Nordhaus wrote back in the 1990s could ever be published today. Uh, you know, tell, tell me about it. Uh, here are three papers from 2021 and 2022. Warren Hope and or Hope et al. and Hope is responsible for uh, the model called PAGE, which is one of the main integrated assessment models that neo neoclassical economists have produced. 3.67% fall in GDP from a 4%, 4 degree increase in temperature. Uh, Khan et al. 7.22% fall. Notice how they've, they've got two decimal places of accuracy for the damage that's going to happen from climate change in 80 years time when they can't even get today's GDP to one decimal place of accuracy. And my favourite, most recently, a paper by a set of economists, including a guy called Gernot Wagner, who likes to put himself across as being a sort of economic greenie. Uh, this paper came out and said that losing the Arctic summer sea ice, Greenland, West Antarctic ice shelf, Amazon, the Gulf Stream, Asian methane hydrates, permafrost, and the Indian monsoon would reduce GDP by 1.4% compared to a world in which none of those got tipped. Just absurd. Sim simply crazy small numbers. And now the most recent IPCC, again it's referring to the same bunch of neoclassical delusional uh, zealots. Warming of 4 degrees will cause a 10 to 23% decline in annual global GDP relative to global GDP without warming at all. So in other words, they're, they're factoring in growth which would reach uh, a level of, G of GDP per capita four to five times today's level in 2100, and they're saying rather than being four to five times, it'll be three to four times. But you'd be so much more wealthy you wouldn't even notice. So again, it's coming off as a, as a trivial impact from climate change. Whereas scientists who actually know what they're talking about when it comes to the impact of temperatures like this on the sustainability of human society on, on, the, on the biosphere, they're terrified about two and three degrees. So this is Hansen back in 2016 saying two degrees is, is dangerous. Uh, Stefan and L saying there could be tipping cascades could start from two degrees and up. Lenton saying that you simply don't want to tip any of these tipping points. It's too risky to bet against them because the forces we un would unleash by tipping those tipping points would be far greater than anything we'd ever do ourselves in response. And a recent paper came out and at least gave me a nice number saying uh, three degrees we see as extreme climate change. In other words, do not even get there. But look what the economists talking about, four degrees, six degrees, etc., etc. They're not on the same intellectual milieu. They're not, they're not realising the same issues as the scientists are. And yet, unfortunately, because politicians are mainly trained in economics or law, uh, they are accepting what the economists say and without knowing it, they're ignoring what the scientists are saying. They, they believe falsely, and I fell for this too initially, that the economists were taking what the scientists had said and then translating that into economic numbers and applying a high discount rate. No, they made up their own damn numbers. They made up their own models. They're not using the global circulation models that scientists have made. They're using what they call integrated assessment models, which they made up themselves which are themselves just shots full of weaknesses. Now, some of the assumptions they made to reach these numbers literally um, were that a roof will protect you from climate change. Didn't quite say it that way. Nordhaus said that uh, activities like microprocessor fabrication are undertaken in carefully controlled environments that will not be directly affected by climate change. And then, I mean, it's as important as microprocessors are, they're not 87% of the economy, but he assumed everything in, that, in, in the category of manufacturing, mining, utilities, finance, trade, wholesale and retail services would be unaffected. He couldn't think of ways in which they'd be affected by climate change. For his lack of imagination, we are facing catastrophe. The IPCC that brought the same sort of story, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, mining, at least they realised there's open cut mining, uh, which Nordhaus apparently didn't realise, 
uh, but manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments, not really exposed to climate change. Nonsense. But this is an essential part of the assumptions they're making. And of course, we're seeing it's nonsense now because the extreme drought in China right now is forcing microprocessor fabrication systems to shut down because there's not enough air conditioning and not enough water. And they've got to keep the people alive rather than produce the output. So, you know, it's all going to fall apart. We're going to see it happen live in real time in the next decade if we're lucky. Uh, and then the question will be who's responsible for this, for us not seeing this coming? Partially it's the fossil fuel companies, but and fundamentally it's the economists who've been the arms dealers giving the fossil fuel companies the capacity to effectively plausibly deny the dangers we face. And that's why I think they're actually negligent to a point of criminality. This work should never have been published, and the people who've done it have contributed, ultimately, I expect, to the collapse of human civilization. So another crazy assumption, that you can use GDP and temperature data today to, imp to, to predict the impact of global warming. And this is the, when, this is, when I first read this, I realized you guys are just delusional beyond belief. You think you can find what global warming is going to do by looking at the statistical relationship between temperature today and income today across the, across the planet. Just insane. They also said so they've built their own models called integrated assessment models rather than using the global circulation models developed by scientists. <coughs> Pardon me. Those IAMs don't include uh, rainfall. They simply include temperature. So this is one of the things I find ironic because economists will parrot on forever about specialization and how we should all specialize and do what we're best at, comparative advantage and so on. They're not experts on modeling the climate. Why did they not let the climate scientists do it, including precipitation as well as temperature, and then tack their economic bit on the end? No, they did their own thing. They ignored what the scientists have done and they don't include precipitation. And what they do instead, and this is a, a classic element of delusion, integrated assessment models often assume that other climate variables scale with temperature, meaning that if temperature gets better, according to their model, so does rainfall. Well, that's a nice little assumption. Do you want to test it the hard way? That's what we're doing, unfortunately. Uh, they're now realizing some of the weaknesses in their early work. So rather than looking at temperature and GDP today, they're looking at change in temperature and change in GDP over time. But having done that, they then extrapolate the relationship they found there in a linear fashion through to 2100. So here's um, the Khan and Mahadi's paper, and the gray area is the area of their prediction of the damages to GDP from different levels of temperature increase. We are, of course, are back here at the moment. And you can just tell that is a straight linear extrapolation. They are assuming no structural change in the climate over the next 80 years. Do you want to test it the hard way? That's what we're going to do, thanks to these idiots. Uh, and then when they model tipping points, of course, we've got data. Um, it's feasible to argue we have data on uh, change in temperature and change in GDP, uh, where the change in temperature is going from about two to 0 0.2 degrees above pre-industrial to maybe 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. How do you extrapolate that forward? They simply use a quadratic. So here's Dietz and Wagner and co saying that uh, losing those eight tipping points I mentioned earlier would reduce uh, global consumption per capita by 1.4% at six degrees warming based on a second order polynomial fit of the data. So they've got data between 0 0.2 and 0 0.8 and they then extend it forward to six degrees using a quadratic. And they also, again, another one of these cases where they're using a quadratic, we assume losses rise quadratically. Well, that'd be nice if that were true. There'd be nothing to worry about until the temperature hit 10 and 15 degrees above pre-industrial levels, at which stage you'd start to run out of, a, of, of a, a biosphere. But it is ludicrous to assume that as the function. So why do they use a quadratic? Because they're lazy. It's what, it's what they've always done. They use quadratics as part of their optimization routines because it's easy to solve a quadratics first differential as linear, fit that in with the cost, cost level, and it's easy to get your uh, cost benefit maximum coming out of it. Um, but it is insane to use that in the case of global warming. Uh, now, and people have been saying this for decades, I'm by, by far from the only person 
who's done that. So Stanton, Ackerman and Carter in 2009 said there's no rationale, empirical or theoretical, for using a quadratic for the damage function, although the practice in dem- is endemic in em- integrated assessment models. Weizmann, who committed suicide after uh, Nordhaus was given the Nobel Prize, uh, rather than him, uh, we may be underestimating damages using a quadratic damages function. Uh, Pindic made, made a quite... This the, you don't often get statements like this into a referee journal unless it's absolutely true. The damage function is made up out of thin air. There's absolutely no basis for using a quadratic as Nordhaus does and all the others do. So what I want to do is to show you what happens when you compare a quadratic to an exponential because one of the great weaknesses of the human mind is not being able to contemplate what exponential growth means. We tend to linear extrapolate when we actually get caught up in exponential processes. So I'm going to do what they've done to do it well. So I'm using a third party database, not one that I've made up, which is what they did. To, they made up their own numbers and then fitted functions to it. So there happens to be a database um, uh, in the America called the uh, Billion Dollar Climate and Weather Damages Database, maintained by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA another very clever acronym, and they keep track of uh, events which cause more than a billion dollars worth of damage every year. And then they've got a whole lot of classifications of of different sorts of damage, but that's the data. And you've got up to, uh, you know, it's a tiny fraction of of GDP, up to 2% at the top there. I'm not quite certain what would be the major disaster that caused that, but that's the pattern over the last 40 years mapped against the uh, temperature change that's occurred also over the last 40 years. Now, you fit that with a quadratic, an exponential, and a logistic, and you literally cannot tell the functions apart. They are all overlaid along that curve there. And the functions themselves, <coughs> that's the empirical fitting of the data. So the quadratic has a, fo- has a, has a coefficient of 0. 0.005 times change in temperature squares. Uh, to compare that to Nordhaus, he has 0.002 times temperature squared. The exponential and the logistic function. So no difference at all in current data. What happens when you go past one degree? That's what happens. So here's the quadratic prediction, and that said six degree increase in temperature, 20% fall in GDP. The other two say that by the time you get to six degrees, there is no economy. So the quadratic fit says it'll all be gone by three degrees and the logistics says it'll be gone by five degrees. And that's the game we're playing right now. We're risking the survivability of human civilization on this planet to prove or disprove neoclassical economic theory. I'd rather get rid of neoclassical economic theory completely. It's a scourge, it has to go. So the quadratic says no worries at all. Uh, The exponential says it's all gone this century. And just again to emphasize that chart once more. So you go back to here, and that's, that's the range of data that they were using is between this point and that point. And of course, there's virtually nothing in the data. But if there is anything in the data, it's going to fit something like a, a, a logistic because the damages will rise exponentially and then taper towards 100% because you can't have more than 100% damages. But this is what Nordhaus thinks is going to happen. This is the numbers that we got from our, my, I got from my own little quadratic fit. This is fitting a logistic and that's an exponential. And you do not want to be here, okay? But we are here and that's our danger. And we're seeing it happening right now. So we have to get away from thinking in optimization and go to regarding climate change as an existential risk. But because these bastards have the ear of the finance sector, they're the ones that get listened to. This is what his name, Stuart, what's, what's his name? Uh, Stuart Kirk, that's right, who was an uh, advisor of HSBC and came out saying it's all a worry. Why, why, it's not a worry at all, been exaggerated. Who cares if the GDP is 5 or 10% smaller in 2100? Uh, and that's the framing that dominates both the finance sector and the politicians. And what they don't realise is the people like myself who are saying this is a serious existential threat. We're not doomists, we're realists. We're saying unless you treat it as a, a, equivalent on an enormous order of magnitude bigger scale to a Second World War threat, where if you don't do something, you're going to be learning German uh, in England, because that'll be the official language, uh, it's, 
take this seriously. Don't think the whole thing, the most important thing is not to do too much. We simply can't let ourselves get anywhere near the levels of damage that we're now seeing coming our way. And the, the change will be irreversible once we get to that point. So this is now looking at what scientists are arguing, and this is a paper by Will Steffen, who's now an honorary professor at, at the ANU, making the point that if you look at the nature of uh, the global climate, the pre-industrial climate, we fluctuated mainly spending our times in uh, a sort of lower temperatures than today, glaciation, cycling between the two. Uh, and we've now pushed ourselves up out of that and we are now running towards what he calls a hothouse earth. Unless we deliberately change direction, we're going to trigger a set of changes in the feedback systems in the, uh, the earth's climate that'll push us into a hothouse earth, which could be several degrees warmer and be inimical, not just to human civilization, but to the vast majority of life forms alive today. Now, I blame economists in general, not just the ones who wrote this stuff, because no other discipline would accept the absurd assumption that these lot have made and, and let the referee papers pass. Uh, and they're accepted because of Friedman's delusion that assumptions don't matter. Um, and the way he put it back in 1953 was the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. And that's used all the time by neoclassicals to avoid logical and empirical criticisms of their own theory. And once you've done that so many damn times, uh, you accept any absurd assumption if it supports neoclassical conclusions. So they've softened their brains to allow anything to pass which reaches a neoclassical con uh, um, conclusion. And I call it the neoclassical disease in the New Economics of Manifesto. And it starts from an innate belief that capitalism can cope with anything. Therefore, climate change can't be an existential threat. And, and the, but the key source of this delusion in a practical sense is how they model the role of energy in production. And most mainstream economy models now use the Cobb-Douglas production function. They use CES as well, but this is the main one they use. And what that says is output <coughs> of GDP is the product of technology times labor times capital, where they're all raised to powers reflecting the share of the so-called factor of production in GDP. And in case of capital, with K to the alpha, alpha is normally 0 0.3. Now there's no mention of energy there, and that's why you get nonsense like Nordhaus saying he couldn't think of ways in which there'd be a direct impact of climate change on manufacturing in the next 50 to 70 years. But if you, when, when they do add energy in, they treat it as the third factor, and they simply do the same thing. They use its share of GDP as its exponent. So this is from a paper in 2016. And they added, they had K times L times E, and notice they've got alpha and, and I think that's mu, I get my Greek letters mixed up. Um, and the value of that is three, which is 0 0.03, which is saying that energy was roughly 3% of GDP. Now what that means is, you could have an 80% fall in energy and only cause a 5% fall in GDP. So this is the function. You've got energy input as a percentage on the, the pre-crisis levels on the horizontal axis. You run out from there and say, what if we have an 80% fall in energy? What does your production function predict will happen to GDP? The answer is it'll fall from 100% to 95%. Only a 5% fall. Why worry? And you get this turning up in a recent research paper as well by Rudy Bachmann, who's a fairly rabid neoclassical German, but based in, based in, in um, America these days. And they said, what happens if we, uh, because of the, the uh, Ukraine war, what if, if we get an embargo on energy from Russia? What'll happen? And they said a 10% fall in energy would cause about a 1.5% fall in German gross national uh, expenditure. Now that's more extreme than the usual 0 0.3. That's using a particular um, value for the CES function. Uh, whereas the post-Keynesian production function, which is the Leontiev, would say, well, 10% fall in energy, you're gonna get a 10% fall in GDP. So you put this chart together, this is from the Backman paper, and the first orange line up there is the standard neoclassical, well, or the purple line, that's the standard neoclassical minimum. Uh, that's where the Cobb-Douglas production applies. The best they could get um, was this modified version using a CES production function. And that says 
you know, about a 8% fall. And Le Leontief, uh, which he, uh, he doesn't realize post-Keynesians use it, but that's the post-Keynesian prediction, pretty much says 10% fall in energy, 10% fall in GDP. Now, they said, well, don't worry. Uh, losing energy is not going to matter. Reason being, uh, substitution and reallocation will keep the cost well below 3%. So rather than putting coal inside your blast furnace, yeah, you can put people. Pardon me. Um, and he said, public fear-mongering about the catastrophic consequences of an energy embargo does not hold up to academic standards. Yeah, but these are neoclassical standards, so let's just take a good look at them. So he rejected, Backman rejected the idea that there could be a one-for-one -one relationship between GDP and energy, or between change in energy and change in GDP, because that conflicts with neoclassical theory. So what he said was, if factor markets are competitive, so that factor prices equal marginal products, then the price of energy would, in that situation, would jump from one over alpha, uh, a jump to one over alpha, while the price of others would fall to zero. Since this hasn't happened, uh, the theory, uh, the, the, the uh, Leontief relationship must be wrong. You take a look at it, the correlation between change in energy and change in GDP is virtually one for one. This is the data. Uh, I've got the bank, uh, World Bank data on one side and IEA data on the other. And it, it, is a, it is a one for one relationship. I'm using the same scale on the left hand side. So 2% change in GDP, 2% change in energy. So this isn't just that the correlation is high, the relationship is virtually one for one. So this is one of the, the great shape quotes from philosophy of science. The great tragedy of science, a beautiful theory destroyed by an ugly fact. The ugly fact is that the Leontief model is correct. Energy is essential for production. And the, their claims that, it, that it's not essential are based on a delusional model of production. Let's look at that in slightly more detail. This is the standard model. So you have outputs, which we never put actual um, um, units on them, but it's effectively widgets, so a generalized commodity. Widgets per year is technology times labor times capital, raised to those exponents, and they sum to one, which is a reasonable assumption that gives you constant returns to scale. <coughs> and the value they give on the exponents comes from income shares which they assume were equal to the marginal products of labor and capital, and they're again assumed to be equal to the real wage and the profit rate. Now, labor gets 70%, capital gets 30, neoclassicals use alpha is equal 0 0.3, they bring in energy as a third factor, and they add it in, in the beta in this particular case, they'll based on energy shares, and in Backman's case, he set that to 0 0.04. But it's not a third independent factor. This is coming back to the original contribution I made back in 2000. And 19. The production relationship is not income is technology times labor times capital times energy. It's in income is technology times labor given an energy input times capital given an energy input. With no energy input, nothing out the other side. So how to expand on that L bracket C and K bracket C. The simplest way to do it is to talk about the la uh, energy labor and energy terms being the number of units of labor <coughs> pardon me and the numbers of units of capital there the energy consumption of labor that's everything you consume over a year and the same for machinery all the energy that's put into machinery over a year times the efficiency with which that energy is turned into useful work now that is a vital point because when you look at um, what people do these days, most of the energy we consume, we consume for pleasure. Uh, the huge amount of energy, we, uh, we bathe in energy all the time without even being really conscious of it. But in terms of the energy we put into work, only a tiny fraction of that energy is then used to enable us to do work. So the work capacity of a, of a human today is the same as a Roman slave, just you get a lot more energy uh, in, in yourself out of a modern capitalist society than you got back in the in the Roman days. Now the energy input to a machine, and that's that's the vital point here. This is this argument here that has grown exponentially since the Industrial Revolution. If you go back to the um, James Watt steam engine, it consumed about nine tons of coal per day. Elon Musk's Falcon rockets consume nine tons per second. <laughs> 
So the energy we're putting into machinery has increased by a factor of 25, 50,000. And that's a large part of where the wealth we've experienced in capitalism has come from. Now I'm going to rearrange these, this equation here and show you what you get as a result of it. So you now, I've now substituted L times the L times uh, the little e L in 1 minus alpha times K to the alpha. I've left out the A because that's going to, as you'll see, that'll end up being superfluous. Those are extract terms, and I've now got energy for the machine. I've now taken out, this is the, <coughs> pardon me, had, a, had an operation a couple of days ago, so I'm still recovering a bit. This is the standard cobb douglas production function without the technology. This bit is now equivalent to the technology term. Rearrange, this is a set of constants, so I can just reduce that to CL. I've now got the energy input to the representative machine times the efficiency with which that's turned into useful work raised to the alpha. Now that means the coefficient for energy is no longer the beta coefficient up here which is 0 0.03 or 0 0.04, it's, 0 .0, it's a 0 0.04, it's now 0 0.3. <coughs> so you've got a much larger coefficient, so energy plays a much larger role in this revised form even before you start empirically improving things. So what that means is rather than getting a result of saying it's uh, going to cause a 0.4% fall, it's now going to cause a 3% fall, still using a Cobb-Douglas production function. But even that's not enough uh, because when you look at why the Cobb-Douglas production function fits domestic data, it's as Sheikh explained in one of the most brilliant papers ever written in critical economics called the Humbug Production Function. He explained that the cobb douglas production function is a non-linear reformation of the identity that GDP equals wages plus profits under conditions of slowly changing income shares. Brilliant piece of work. And therefore, of course it fits the data. You're regressing one against one. But when you do international comparisons, it fails completely. And of all people, Gregory Mancu did a very good job on this front back in 1995, saying if you actually want to use the Cobb-Douglas production function to fit in international data, then you have to set the alpha coefficient not to 0 0.3, but to 0 0.8. Now that throws out their theory of income distribution to begin with. But it's, it then means in the case we're looking at here, that the coefficient for energy is 20 times the number they actually use. And therefore, rather than getting a 3% fall, you'd now get an 8% fall in GDP out of a 10% fall in energy input. But again, as I've said, even that's not enough because when you take a look at the data, you get an incredibly strong regularity between change in GDP and change in energy. So let's look at it using a sensible production function now, the, uh, the Leontia function. So you have output uh, being equal to capacity utilization times the number of machines divided by V. Now what's V? Well, let's actually now do the same thing I did with the uh, Cobb-Douglas, but feed that into the Leontief expression. So I do that, and I know that Q uh, is equal to Y divided by EK. I'll explain this uh, modification in a moment, which is capacity, capacity utilization times capital times the efficiency with which uh, energy machines turn energy into useful work. So this bit here, Q, that's the widgets per year bit, which is standard the way production function is written. Y is output in energy terms, and I'm dividing it by the energy uh, per widget, the energy of the input of the representative machine. And that leaves little e k, which is turning up here, and that is going to be equal to 1 over v. So the energy aware version of Leontief of production function is output in widgets, is the cap ut capacity utilization of machinery, times the number of machines multiplied by the efficiency with which machines convert energy into useful work. So that's what, with the Leontief function, all we have to do is think more clearly about what it actually stands for. It's not just some strange empirical regularity in the data, it's, under, it's finding something deep in the data, and that is that the machinery is a means to turn free energy into useful work and how efficiently that is done tells you how much GDP you get per machine. So out of that you get a linear relationship. There's a 10% fall in energy, there'll be a 10% fall in GDP. Now I'm going to have a bit of fun at Backman's expenses, I don't particularly like him, so let's have a bit of fun here. He's had a go at me on a couple of occasions, it was delightful to be able to return the favour. So he's saying using the Cobb-Douglas production function where you have energy uh, 
to the alpha and everything else to the x uh, to the one minus alpha. A drop of energy reduces production by 0.4 percent. Now he made a little slip there. Um, uh, he should have, should have had 0.4. So I'll fix that typo up and see so he's got the change in in the log of y will be 0.4 percent. Whereas the Leontief implies a 10 percent fall. He says intuitively the Leontief assumption means energy is an extreme bottleneck in production. Yes it is Rudy. This is realism. Okay? This is what you should be using. Only a neoclassical economist could find it remarkable that energy is an extreme bottleneck. Why do you refuel your car? Because it's run out of energy. But this is how insanely stupid they've made themselves with neoclassical thought. And that's why I come back to my little insight. Labor without energy is a corpse. Capital without energy is a sculpture. Without being aware of that, by leaving it out, they've imagined a world in which you can produce output without energy. There's no such world. So the mathematical form makes a huge difference. There's one reason I'm emphatic about the need for non-orthodox economists to learn mathematics well. Get taught it by mathematicians, not by economists, because it gives you a way of thinking about the real world, which is realistic, unlike the garbage that neoclassicals continue to spew. So once you reform it and say that rather than there being three factors of production, capital, labor, and energy, instead there are two factors of production, both of which need energy to work, you get enormous consequences for your model. So when you take a look at the data, it's again, it's ridiculous how overwhelmingly powerful and obvious the data is. This is data from the, um, uh, in, in kilotons of energy, I forgot what KTEO stands for, but it's one of the many measures of energy from uh, one authority on the horizontal axis. On the vertical, I've got world GDP. I think that's from the World Bank. Yep, okay. And you get, you know, straight line fit between the two. And when you look at the change, Again, the correlation coefficient is 0.83. I'll go away. Ah. <coughs> the program I use to get spyware off my, off my computer, but it keeps on thinking I haven't paid it. Must have been written by neoclassical economists. Okay, let's go. Next. So the data validates the approach post Keynesians it went for because it was empirically grounded. And again, the realism of the post Keynesian approach is its major strength. Rather than living in a fantasy world and trying to make up a fantasy system where capitalism is the best of all possible social systems, we're simply saying, what does the data tell us? How can we model it? How can we put it together? So that's output and useful energy per year. That's capacity utilization, number of machines, and the efficiency of energy conversion. Now, when you put that into a production model based on uh, macroeconomics, uh, I've done this in my uh, most recent book, The New Economics and Manifesto shown that you get a cyclical model coming out of working from macroeconomics as your foundation for macro. So I define the employment rate as lambda, which is equal to how many people have a job divided by population. The wages share as being total wages divided by the GDP. And in the end of it, the end result is a cyclical model, um, which I've modeled in my Minsky software here. And uh, again, I explain that in detail in the manifesto and also in a, a support book. But I might just quickly cheat and see if I can bring this up on the screen and run the simulation because one thing I want to happen at the end of the course you're doing is that you all start, when you do your modeling, <coughs> you use this program rather than um, anything else. And oh, great, it didn't actually bring up that particular, it didn't actually load the model. I don't know why that didn't happen. So I'm stuck, I'll have to do that in a later presentation back shortly. So economics needs to be useful and that's the role that you people studying with Stephen and, 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 and Gabby are attempting to do. We have to work out how to finance the scale of energy conversion that's necessary. And because we know from modern monetary theory that government deficits creates money and creates reserves, <coughs> there is no inability for a government to fund its own activities in its own currency then we can finance the scale of change that is necessary um, using government money creation because there's no way the private sector will be able to cope with this. Just like we didn't outsource World War II to the private sector, we're not going to outsource global, uh, fighting global warming to the private sector either. We'll employ them using money created by the state, but it's all quite feasible. So what you're learning in this course will be, first of all, deficits create money in excess reserves. Excess reserves are used to buy the bonds, um, bonds for sales to public reduce spending power. All these things were done during the Second World War. <coughs> and of course, one paper I'm sure you're going to be reading is Beersley Rummel, Taxes for Revenue are Obsolete. 
So we have to get this understanding uh, into the public arena, get past the stupidity of neoclassical economists on that topic as well as on climate change. Now in this world, degrowth is inevitable. Because we're so dependent upon fossil fuels, we're way at the top end of that, li of that line there, we're going to be forced to go in the opposite direction. And the real dilemma is if we do that with the current distribution of income, there'll be starving poor millions who will revolt against the system and will break down long before we get to anything like the levels that Nordhaus is talking, talking about. And that's because we've overshot with the, what we can actually get out of the biosphere on a sustainable front. So we have to reduce the amount we're consuming. But we can't do it and put the burden on the poor rather than the rich. So one solution I've been working with with a guy called Adam Hardy, who thought of it before I came up with it myself. And he's a non-academic, but he got into it very, very well. He said, we need a way of rationing carbon. And this is, if you check on that a link there, you'll find the actual full detailed idea. It's not politically feasible until the challenge becomes apparent, the scale of the challenge. But as it happens, it's one reason I support the development of uh, digital currencies by central banks because I can see that as the vehicle through which we could do the rationing necessary. Now the second best is huge transfers to the poor through government deficits and that's what we should do, that's what we can do, we know that's the case. The main barrier will be neoclassical thinking about how money is created. Now the next question, is it actually physically feasible to do what's necessary before you reach critical levels of CO2? Unfortunately, I don't believe it is. It's not my work. This is the work of an excellent Australian mining engineer now working in Finland called Simon Marshall. And he did a brilliant study of what's necessary to go from a fossil fuel world to a, um, what he calls a mineral world, where you're you know, collecting solar power with, uh, with photovoltaic cells, you're picking up uh, uh, wind power with turbines and so on. So he's calling it a mineral uh, economy rather than a, a fossil fuel economy. And what he did was say, well, let's look at the current, um, this, is, this is the current amount of energy produced by renewable uh, or non-carbon non based forms in 2018. The rest of up here is all fossil fuels. So we're going to replace this and expand this out sideways so we have the same relative ratio between each of these inputs here, what's necessary. And it's 800 new nuclear power stations and 12,000 new hydro. I think that's obvious already that it's not going to happen. 63,000 new wind farms, 70,000 solar and 600 geothermal and 75,000 bio waste. We're not going to do it. We're simply not going to do it. Nor do we have the minerals to get the entire way. So because they've been working in aggregate production functions, uh, when I did my, my master's and PhD, uh, going on 40 years ago now, 35, 40 years ago, all the neoclassicals in my university uh, were doing um, models of their own economies called computable general equilibrium models, which were input-output models using the input-output matrix for each of their economies. And their idea of general equilibrium is at a point in time and between different markets. Now, since then, after the so-called <coughs> Lucas rational expectations revolution, they've just used the Cobb-Douglas production function. They've ignored the input-output dynamics. So they, they don't have any vision of what's actually happening in terms of inputs to produce outputs. So the, again, the, the change from CGE to DSGE models by mainstream was another huge step backwards in terms of capacity to understand the real world. Um, so what you find is when you look at the periodic table, and these are the, the natural inputs we're using to produce all the outputs we produce right now, how many of them are in threatened levels? And it's actually scarily high. Uh, you can't, there is no substitute for helium. There is no, you can use zinc for some things you use other metals for to some extent. But those are, those are uh, metals already where the supplies are already at critical levels. The one that's scariest to me of all is phosphorus. Because phosphorus is absolutely essential for life. When you bend your arms, just flex your muscles, you're turning adenosine triphosphate into adenosine biphosphate. You need phosphate to do that. Now, we have built the scale of our population and the scale of our civilization on artificial generation of phosphorus-based uh, fertilizers. And we're already starting to run out of the phosphorus itself. And there's no substitute. You cannot substitute phosphorus for something else. The idea of substitutability, which is such a, a key canon for neoclassicals, is just nonsense.
when you look at the physical world. And there's a whole range of other elements, including obviously lithium, which are essential for modern production, which are themselves all in limited supply. So we are not going to be able to reach the scale of output we need. We'll need rationing. <coughs> and this is going to return to that theme I mentioned earlier. I would like to see central banks create a digital account for every citizen and use those to distribute universal carbon credits at an identical rate, which could start at the average for the, each country. Now, if you do that, because the income distribution is so skewed, 95% <clears throat> of the population would have excess universal carbon credits, but the top 5% would exhaust their UCCs and have to buy off the other 95%. Therefore, 95% of the population would benefit from this scheme. So you need something which is politically palatable <clears throat> to start straight away. And you would then be redistributing income from the rich to the poor. Uh, and putting pressure on corporations and the wealthy to reduce the carbon intensity of what they're doing. And uh, take a look, I'd, I'd like you to look at the proposal and maybe do a master's thesis on it, take it further for us. And of course, government finance will be vital for that transition as well, because reducing output is not profitable. The only institution in the society which can create the monetary power to enable that transition to occur is the government. Uh, and we need a way to finance investment in a world of declining world output. Now, I'll finish with a couple of um, points that I think you'll find useful in terms of taking on so-called climate change sceptics. You get this argument of temperature's always been changing. What, what, what's the problem? And it's true. If you look at 500 million years of data, broken down into nice little divisions here by a brilliant piece of collating research by scientists, that's the global temperature. The scale on the left is Celsius, the scale on the right is Fahrenheit. And this is our period of human civilization. And this is actually, that, that very long line there is actually one of these peaks. They're called Milanchevik cycles. And they're variations in the temperature of the, of the planet, of the biosphere, caused by variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun, which also then trigger changes in carbon dioxide. So they're, they're tied together. But we evolved on the peak. No, we didn't evolve. We, we, we built industrial civilization on one of those peaks. So if you look at us as a species, we began about here, about 300,000 years ago, maybe that point. The, you know, our species evolved in Africa. The previous, we've lived through one Melanchovic peak 130,000 years ago, and we didn't develop industrial civilization. We hadn't even left Africa at this stage as a species. So long before we became the dominant species on the planet. Uh, we, but our sedentary civilizations began at the next peak along here. And because you've got an up period and a down period, the turning point gives you a more stable climate. It's rising when you evolve, it's, uh, the, when you cre create the industrial civilization, it's falling back down as you get to the other side of it. So we had a slow change in the climate during what we call the Holocene because the Earth was already in a turning point and that's when we built our industrial civilization. Now, if that stability goes, so we don't have the stable temperature anymore, then we won't have our sedentary civilization either. And this is what neoclassicals don't realize. They're destroying the basis on which human civilization was built. Um, another one, I, I literally heard this when I was um, a, a master's student myself at, Sydney, at New South Wales University in the late 80s. We got herded into the, um, the biggest theatre on the canvas to, campus to go and listen to an English academic. I'm, I'm guessing it was Pierce, but I'm not sure. And he literally said at one stage, what's wrong if it gets a bit warmer? I'll wear one less cardigan. I thought, you turp. You don't know what you're talking about. I didn't realise how dangerous he was. Well, one thing which could happen as the temperature gets warmer is the three circulation cells that we currently have in each hemisphere. Uh, from zero to 30 degrees, the tropical zone, or that's known as the, uh, uh, that's the ferrous cell, I think. <clears throat> 30 to 60, and then 60 to 90, those three cells could turn into one. <clears throat> now, what that would mean is that the moisture would rise at the, um, at the uh, tropics and fall a bit there, go to the pole and fall a bit there, and in the middle, you'd have a desert. That's what could happen. And that's, notice whether the dry region is shown in this illustration. This is from a climate scientist, by the way, or an astronomer. Uh, that becomes a desert. Pretty lousy place to have a desert when you have 350 million people living there and the world's most advanced industrial civilization. But the scariest little lot comes from the professor of 
a Harvard professor of chemistry uh, who discovered the hole in the ozone layer. He argues there's this mechanism that will occur when the Arctic breaks down, that the extra heat generated at the, uh, at the equator will cause dramatic uplift and moisture to take uh, clouds, to take, take precipitation moisture into the, into the biosphere, and that moisture will take with it chlorine and bromide, which is currently floating around in the troposphere atmosphere we, we all breathe, but in small enough concentrations that it doesn't damage us. But when it gets up into the stratosphere, it could destroy the ozone layer. Now, if that happens, life in the northern hemisphere would become impossible. That's the sort of stuff we're playing with. So in their attempt to prevent capitalism being criticised, which begins with their attack on the limits to growth, they've set us up for the destruction of capitalism. And that's why they've got to go. We simply have to get them, all of them, Let's start a universal basic income and make its first usage enabling neoclassical economists to stay at home and not teach anybody and not lead into the delusions they're currently leading us into. I'll finish with a little bit of a plug for myself. If you like what I'm doing, then please help me keep doing it through supporting me on either Patreon or Substack. Uh, the ne one of the great tragedies is the neoclassics are getting enormous amount of money. They've got huge numbers of people working with them. They complain about not having enough, but they get a hundred times as much as rebels like myself get. We get nothing from the public purse. We have to get support from the public as well. So help me out if you can to keep on taking them on and take them on yourselves. Follow what you learn from this course with Stephen and, and, and Gabby and let's bring about a realistic alternative economics to replace this nonsense called neoclassical economics.